Alrighty, welcome to the final section of chapter 12 that we're going to learn about, which is probability for compound events. Here we'll have just a few vocabulary words, and then we'll get lots of examples to kind of suss out what this stuff means. So there are a couple different ways of looking at things. First is a simple event, which is just one thing happening with a certain probability. So a single event just means one thing is happening and has a certain probability of occurring. So this could be like the percent chance that it's sunny today, or the probability that you roll a dice and you get a five, or something like that. So single event, one thing. Uh, then more complicated would be a compound event, which is a sequence of multiple simple events. So lots of different things happening, um, and it's compounded because you might say you need both of them to happen, or you need one or the other, or first the second and then the second, uh, sorry, first the first event and then the second event. So it could be the order that matters, or both or neither, something like that. And then joint probability is the probability of the compound event coming off the way that you want it to. So compound event is what the sequence of events is called, and then the joint probability is the overall probability for that compound event to occur. Okay, moving on. Some more vocabulary words, different kinds of events. So independent events are simple events whose probabilities do not depend on each other. What this means is the two things have no correlation. So for example, if you flip a coin and then you roll a dice, the outcome of one has no impact on the outcome of the other. So those would be independent. Dependent events, on the other hand, means where one thing is affected by or can affect what happens with the other one. So the outcome of one event will determine or have an influence on the outcome of the other event. So one depends on the other. Third one here, complementary events. So complementary means that together they form a pair or a whole. So an event plus its non-event, which means either it happens or it doesn't happen, and the total is always 100%. So let me give you an example. Uh, the chance that it rains today and the chance that it doesn't rain today. Those two events are complementary, and the probability total is 100% because either it's going to rain or it's not going to rain. So an event and a non-event, non-event meaning the lack of the original event. So they always complement and add up to 100%. Finally, we have here mutually exclusive events. Mutually exclusive means that they can't both happen. So mutually exclusive would be on a single coin flip, getting a heads and getting a tails. Obviously, you cannot have both of those happen at the same time. If one happens, then you know the other does not happen. Okay, so here's some problem solving tips. Uh, notation is going to be important for probabilities. We want to make sure that we're writing it in a clear way that everyone understands. So there's two ways you can note the probability of an event A happening. P parentheses A or P sub A. Personally, I usually like subscripts, so I'll do like P sub A for probability of event A happening. And whatever event A happens to be, um, you typically want to write that down as the subscript. So if it's a dice roll or of rain or of um, your team winning a certain game or something like that, you can write that here in the subscript. So joint probability, the formula for joint probability is the product of all the individual probabilities. If you want all of the things to happen, so they're and, and, and. If you want all of them to happen, then the first one has to happen, so you take that probability, you multiply it by the probability of the second one happening, multiply by the probability of the third one happening, etc. So multiply all the probabilities together to get the overall joint probability for independent events. Independent meaning one does not influence the other. Then joint probability for dependent events is basically the same thing except <coughs> your probabilities that you're plugging in for everything except the first event is the probability of the second event happening given the first one because joint probability means the second one is going to depend on the first one. So what's the probability of the second one happening given that the first one happened? What's the probability of the third one happening given that the first two happened, if they could depend on the first? Um, again, when we get to the examples, hopefully this will make it a little more clear. In practice, they're not too difficult to understand, um, even though the notation here is not the most beautiful. All right, a couple more problem-solving tips. If there are mutually exclusive events, which means they cannot both happen, the total probability of either one happening is the sum of the total. So since they can't both happen, you can say, what's the chance of the first one happening? Combine it with the chance of the second one happening, and you add it together. That's the chance that either or will happen. So for example, if probability of A is rolling a 1 on a dice, 
and probability B is rolling a 2 on a dice. The probability of rolling a 1 or a 2 is just the combined probability of those two because they don't overlap. Uh, it's just that simple. However, for non-mutually exclusive events, which means they could both happen, then the total probability of either one happening has to account for the chance they might both happen. So first you add them together, just like normal, but because they might both happen, you could have a little bit of overlap there, and so you have to subtract the probability that they both happened to get the probability of just uh, one or the other happening. Kay. Again, once we see examples, it'll be a little bit more clear. All right, here's some examples. A bag contains two greens, nine browns, seven yellows, and four blue marbles. So let's put that so we know what it is. Once a marble is selected, it is not replaced. Find each probability. So brown, then yellow. So at the beginning, we haven't pulled anything yet, so we have brown, which is nine out of the total uh, marbles is going to be here. Two plus nine is 11. Um, 11 plus 11 more is 22. So 9 out of 22, that's the probability of the first thing happening. Then we multiply by the probability of the next thing happening, then yellow. So yellow, if we've taken a brown out, there's still 7 yellows left in the bag. Out of, now there's only 21 marbles left because we took one out. So we multiply those two things together and that's the probability of brown and then yellow. If we say yellow then yellow, we start off with 7 out of 22, 7 yellows out of 22. But then when we keep going, the probability of getting a second yellow one, now there's only six left out of 21 total marbles. So you look at the probability of the first one, then the probability of the second one based on the first one happening, etc. So we'll just do those two examples here. Now we look down here. A die is rolled and a spinner like the one to the right, A, B, C, D, is spun. Find the probability uh, a four and an A. These two events are unrelated. The rolling of the dice and the spinning of the spinner do not influence each other, so you just multiply the two probabilities together in the most simple way possible. So probability of a four and a dice is one out of six, because there are six different sides you could get. And the probability of getting an A on here is one out of four. Okay, so the probability of getting both a four on the dice and an A on the spinner is one out of 24. Okay, so we're going to pick up here and try number 8. Find the probability for an even number and a C. So to get an even number, if we're rolling a dice, there are three chances out of six. And then when we spin the spinner to get a C, there's one chance out of four, as you can see over here. And if we reduce the three-sixths to one-half, then one-half times one-fourth is one-eighth. So the overall probability of getting both an even number on the dice and a C on the spinner would be one-eighth. Uh, so any kind of these probabilities, whether it's uh, dependent probabilities or independent probabilities, you can see the objective is to first figure out the pro probability for each individual event, and then multiply them together to get the overall joint probability of the compound event. Okay, let's look at some more examples. Um, a card is being drawn from a standard deck of playing cards. Determine whether the probabilities are mutually exclusive or not. Then find the probability. So a jack or a ten. Is it mutually exclusive? Yes, it is, because if we get a jack, then we didn't get a 10. If we get a 10, then we didn't get a jack. So the total probability is the probability of getting a jack plus the probability of getting a 10. Well, the probability of getting a jack is, of course, 4 out of 52, because there's 4 jacks out of 52 cards. And the probability of getting a 10 is 4 out of 52. So the overall probability of getting a jack or a 10 is eight cards out of 52, and then if we reduce that, what do we get? Um, maybe uh, two out of 13, if we divide the top and bottom by four. So two thirteenths chance if you draw a card that it's either a jack or a 10. Okay, let's keep going here. Let's try number 13. So probability of a queen or a club, is it mutually exclusive or not? Well, these are not mutually exclusive because you might draw a card that's a queen and a club, namely the queen of clubs. So here we're going to do the probability of a queen plus the probability of a club and then minus the probability of a queen club because we want to take away the overlap that we accidentally like double counted, if you will. So the probability of getting a queen, there's four cards out of 52. And the probability of getting a club, there's 13 cards out of 52. But you notice that the queen got queen of clubs got counted twice, once as a queen and then again as a club, even though it's only one card. 
So we have to subtract 1 out of 52 so that we didn't actually double count that queen. So the number of unique cards would be 4 plus 13 is 17, minus 1 is just 16 out of 52, and that's going to reduce to uh, 4 over 13. Okay, um, we'll move down here. Tiles numbered 1 through 12 are placed in a box. Tiles numbered 11 through 30 are placed in a second different box. The first tile is randomly drawn from the first box. The second tile is randomly drawn from the second box. So these two um, events are separated from each other. So what's the chance that both are greater than 15? Well, the first tile is in a box uh, of numbered 1 through 20. So what's the chance that it's greater than 15? Well, 16, 17, 18, 19, and 20. So there are five tiles in that box um, out of 20 that would be bigger than 15, like winners in terms of this probability happening. And the probability in the second box, since the numbers are 11 through 30, then how many of them are bigger than 15? Uh, well, there's 20 tiles total, and 15 of those are bigger. Okay, so we multiply these together. Um, a very strong hit tip I have is to reduce the fractions before you multiply them together. So 5 over 20 is 1 fourth, and 15 over 20 is 3 fourths. Multiply them together and we get 3 sixteenths. So again, you're finding the chance of the first thing happening, finding the chance of the second thing happening, multiplying them together, and then see what you get. Uh, I think that's enough examples for now. Um, I look forward to seeing you in class.